And so, um, as many of you, uh, if you've been around our church for very long in the last few years, when we come to the feasts and the festivals of the Lord, we like to give attention to them and teach from them because they give us great revelation concerning the times and the seasons that we're in. Um, we have a, there's a number of feasts and festivals of the Lord that God said they are not just the people call them the Jewish feasts. They're not Jewish feasts. They're God's feasts. He specifically says in scriptures, these are my feasts. These are my moments. These are my times. And so he ins instructed the Jewish people to observe them throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, so that they, they could be maintained and observed, and a particular approach was given to them, which is very, very interesting. Uh, and, and the first ones of the year, as we know, first fruits, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, Passover and unleavened bread, first fruits, and then um, the uh, uh, Shavuot, which we call Pentecost. So the first three of the year, um, which Jesus has, has fulfilled. He has become our unleavened. He has become our Passover lamb. He has risen from the dead as the first fruits from the dead. And the Shavuot was when the word of God came and the Holy Spirit also came at Pentecost. And he fulfilled those at his first coming. The last three, the latter of the year, which commences tonight, is... Um, uh, Rosh Hashanah, or the head of the year, which is the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. Uh, then we have Yom Kippur. You've probably heard of that one, Yom Kippur. Uh, the Day of Atonement, Yom Day, uh, Kippur to cover, the Day of Atonement. And then lastly, um, Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. You've possibly heard of that as well. And those three all happen in this next little season of time. Those three will be fulfilled at Jesus' second coming. And this is why it's important to understand that. Because if you don't understand these feasts, you can really get your eschatology or your end times theology squirrely. You can get all mixed up, meddled up, and you end up putting things out of place and out of time and quoting Jesus in the wrong uh, context uh, and so forth. You also have to understand uh, the, the Jews, the church, and the nations. Uh, and what God is still doing with the Jews right now, even now, that he hasn't finished with them. He still has covenant with them. He's working in Israel. I mean, Israel, Iran, these things are in the news every single day. For such a tiny piece of real estate, how is that possible? It's because it all hinges on this little piece of real estate. There is still God's covenant with that place. And as we support, as Christians and believers, as we support uh, Israel, as we, as we back that, as we pray for that, as we contend for that, uh, we, we tap into the blessing of the Lord and we tap into uh, God's understandings of the times and we, we become, as nations, sheep nations. Now, people often quote, Jesus separated the sheep and the goats, and they think of that as individuals. So bad people go over with the goats and good people go over with the sheep. If you read it in context, he's talking about nations not individuals. That is a specific passage dealing with how God will deal with nations in the end of days. And Jesus identified what's the difference between the nations. What they did or didn't do, as Jesus said, for these my brethren. Well, the church didn't exist when Jesus said this. So who's he talking about in that context? Uh, he's talking about the Jewish people. He's, the talk, he's pointing to the people around him. The brethren, the, the context was Israel. So what a, what a nation does... Now, a nation doesn't do things for individuals. You understand? You can't flip back and forward from individual to nation. He's talking nationally. It's a national uh, passage that he's talking about. So what, what will separate the sheep from the goats nationally is what they did or do did or didn't do, do doing or, or, or are not doing concerning Israel. Hallelujah. And so as Australia, uh, I'm thrilled, continue to be thrilled with the stance that we take as a nation. Ever since the liberation of Beersheba and the passage through to Jerusalem with our light horsemen, Australia and New Zealand, in that charge, uh, all the way through the, nation, the, the history, all the way through the co more recent conflicts, where our SAS, our SAS, has been on the front lines and gone in before almost anybody else. Uh, I mean, they've been in and out well before any, any of the other troops arrived, taken out strategic things and all sorts of stuff. And it's been the Australians, the New Zealanders, the British. Uh, we've, we've had some uh, elite soldiers that have gone in and been a part of that. It's wonderful to know uh, in that context. And so there's a blessing there. And so when we, when we enter into these days, into these end of days, we have to and we should understand the context of what this is. So what is Rosh Hashanah? 
Real briefly, and if you want to go into more depth, I'm going to, I'm going to request that you go back to the archives on our website and pull it up because they're, honestly, to, if I was to do this again today, I wouldn't get where I need to go. I'm talking about the prophetic di dimensions. If I, if, I get, if I get into this now, I get excited about it, and an hour's gone like that, and then I'll be saying to you, I haven't even looked at my notes yet. And I don't want to do that today, because there are some things I need and must, and you, you, you must hear, not just with your natural ears, but your spiritual ears, but very quickly. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh is, means head. Rosh is the head. Uh, ha means the. And Shana means year. The year. So it's the head of the year or the beginning of the year. Uh, in the Gregorian calendar, we would call this January 1st. In the, uh, in the fiscal calendar, we would call this July 1st. Right? We, you say, well, you know, Jewish, Jewish people have three new years, and that's really confusing. Well, we, we know how to deal with different new years. We have a fiscal new year. Uh, it starts July 1st for your taxes and so forth. We have a civil new year or the calendar new year, which starts January 1st. Well, the Jew Jewish people or the God's, God's calendar has a number of different things because of the agricultural new year, the religious new year, and so forth and so on. Well, this is the calendar new year as far as God is concerned. It starts at sundown tonight. So as the sun sets tonight, that is the close of a year and actually the close of a decade as far as uh, uh, the, the rabbis and so forth calculate. So what year have we been in? 5779. 5779 has been the year. And that has been, so, uh, so uh, dust off your flares, you've been in the 70s for the last nine years. Uh, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> cheesecloth and flares and whatever else you can come up with. But you've been in the 70s for the last decade and that is just concluding now. Now, the, now 70 in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word ain. Can you say ayin? A-Y-I-N, ayin. That is the, the, the name ayin is, is the eye, it's the, and it's the symbolized by the eye, or to see. It's the eye. And so, so what you're going to hear, and now this is, this is interesting, and, 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 I'm, and please don't hear me wrong here, I'm not criticizing, and I'm not going to say these, that when people say this, that they're wrong, because I don't believe they will be wrong. But what you're going to hear in the natural is a lot of people look at 2020, and guess what they're going to come up with? 2020 vision. But that's not even God's calendar. <laughs> it's not. Now, I'm not saying that God won't give prophetic words concerning 2020 vision and, and insight and so forth, so don't immediately listen to someone that does that and think, oh, they're off the wall. No, 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 no. I don't agree. I don't, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying let's, we, let's not just automatically lean into something that's, that's a cutesy saying or a, or a technical term we have for eyesight and, and put all the prophetic unction onto that. In fact, if you, if you think about it, what we've been hearing for the last decade, the last n nearly 10 years, has already been an emphasis on the spirit of seeing and knowing, on revelation, on seeing into, on, on unveilings. Hallelujah. So we've actually already been there for the last 10 years. Now what we're stepping into is what we cross over with is into, the, into pay, which is 80, the 80s. Uh, pay is the word for 80, and pay is the Hebrew word for the mouth. The mouth, so what's now been to be said. We see it by faith, and we speak it. Now faith is... Uh, we see it by faith and then we speak it by faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is the image. Hope is the sight that we get. But here's the interesting thing about spiritual sight. Spiritual sight comes from hearing. Spiritual sight doesn't come from seeing, naturally speaking. Spiritual sight comes from hearing. Now, now let me just demonstrate this to you. Even natural sight comes by hearing, really. Because if I say to you, dog... You don't think D-O-G, you don't see D-O-G, you see a dog. You see a little fluffy one. If you've got a Rottweiler, you see a Rottweiler. You see an image. If I say to you, glass, you, you think of a glass. You don't think of g l a <laughs> you, 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 The word produces the image. And this is, this is the way God's word works too. When God speaks, it produces a hope image, but it also, when it's believed, there is a substance, there is the actual spiritual substance that comes, puts pressure on the natural realm and formulates and creates a natural reality. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Uh, and so when God says something, you see it now. And when it gets in abundance in your heart, when the image on the inside of you gets bigger than the image in front of you. Now, now what does the Bible tell us? We walk by faith and not by sight, sight or natural sight. Now, faith is sight as well, but it's spiritual sight. So faith is the actually, actually now knowing the very substance of what you've seen or hoped for in the Spirit. Again, the Word of God produces the hope, which is an image. A hope is a future image, is that right? You don't hope for something you've already got. You know, if I said at the close of the service, I'm going to hand everybody a $100 bill, there would be an image of hope that you might have at this point. Yeah. All right? But if I gave you a $100 bill as you walked in the door, and I said, to every, I said to you all, you've all got a $100 bill, that doesn't produce extra hope in you. It maybe produces thanksgiving. <laughs> but it's not going to be something that you're looking forward to or an image that you have to come. Hope is an image to come. Hope is something that you don't necessarily have yet, but you've got the image of it. And God's Word, when you hear God's Word, when it gets into your heart, it starts to produce the, an image. When God promises you something and says, this is how it's going to be, it produces an image that may be very different from what you're looking at right now. Amen. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things which are seen naturally, but at the things which are not seen naturally. For the things which are seen are just temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It says, so don't look at what you can see, look at what you can't naturally see. You've got to get the image from the word bigger on the inside of you than what your natural eyes are seeing. If, you, if you're believing God for something, the image of what you're believing God for not just by assumption because you want it, but because God has said it, He's promised you, you've got His Word on it, that you've got to meditate on that and meditate. Sometimes you've got to close your eyes to everything else and, and look at that and receive that and meditate on it. So it's so big on, in your heart, it gets so big that out of the abundance of the heart, something's about to come forth. Yeah. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, but that starts with the image, you see. That's why the 70s, that's why that, that, that season of understanding how to look into the season of the seer, the, the understanding, the revelation and the wisdom that comes from seeing over in the Spirit, seeing into the things of God. But now as God has been preparing us, and by the way, he's been, He always prepares for quite a long period of time before it gets to kind of like the you know, D-Day as it were, to that moment of, of the charge. And so he prepares a scripture. So guess what? We've been preparing spiritually and biblically and doctrinally for decades about what it means concerning the words of our mouth. Well, here we are. You better be ready now because now it's time for a, for a, a manifestation of what's about to be spoken and the, the kind of revelation and the kind of harvest that's attached to that that will become quite immediate. And so we better get this thing and understand this thing. And so, and so as the sun sets tonight, we cross over from one decade into another, another decade uh, in terms of that, uh, that, that biblical and rabbinical understanding of, of the years. Um, last week, now think about the preparation of the heart of God in this. Last week we heard an excellent message by Mark on what did God say. You remember that? I mean, it was only a week ago, so you should do. Excellent message. I just got so much out of that. I just got thrilled by that. But think about this. What a wonderful lead up and prep and prep place. Because we have to first of all consider what did God say to then the next question is, so now what are you going to say? Right? Because what God said produced the image that gets abundant in your heart and now produces faith of substance that is released by what you say. Amen. God's word is a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 teaches us that. A two-edged sword. Or in the Greek, it's literally a two-mouthed sword. God speaks his word and you speak his word. It, your, your mouth becomes a container. We'll get back to that in a minute. and You'll see some things that I want you, I want you to see. I actually forgot to uh, let the, the guys know. I had a couple of graphics uh, online uh, to, to show you, um, and, but it's probably too late now. Uh, but I'll try and explain as best I can. Uh, to you. 
Um, so as we approach this new year, we, we approach the head of the year, the, 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 this, this time, this season. Now, one of the things that's important, I'm just going to pull this little bit out. You can go back uh, to all of the messages that I've preached over the last 15 years on this or something uh, each year. Uh, one of the significant things about the uh, Rosh Hashanah and all of the feasts and the festivals of the Lord is that God calls them my holy convocations. And a convocations is an old word. We don't use that in our everyday vernacular anymore. Uh, it lit, the best translation for the word convocations and, and the essence of the Hebrew word that is used there is dress rehearsals. Now, if you've ever been part of... I, I, was, I was brought up in amateur dramatics. My parent dragged me through everything from Oliver to Man of La Mancha and all sorts of stuff. And I was in all of these sort of musicals and shows and all sorts of stuff. My family's still like that today. My, my, my younger brother was a, um, uh, in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre Company. He's now a director. Uh, uh, he directs plays and stuff in London and so forth. Um, and my brother, another one of my brothers is a singer and blah, all sorts of stuff go, going on with my family like that. So we know, we knew what a dress rehearsal was all about. A dress rehearsal is not like any other rehearsal. Because you've got to get your headspace, you've got to get you, your mind into the place where when we go on stage tonight for the dress rehearsal, we have to act, sound, look everything like this is the opening night like this is we got an audience in front of us there's critics there and all sorts of stuff going on so you got you're going to go on and you, the, and what doesn't matter what happens the show must go on you know and, and so you've got to get up you've got you know, the makeup lights camera you know action whatever all that stuff is going on now because it's it's that moment so God actually says I want you to treat all of these as dress rehearsals I want you to treat it like it's the actual thing so what Israel, what Jewish people do when they come to all of these feasts if, is if it's a past event, they reenact it. Think about the Passover evening. What is that? It's a reenacting going through the story of the Passover. And they have different elements in place to help enable that enact, in, enacting out uh, on the table and all sorts of things. So you, you literally go into the Passover like the night of Passover and you kind of act exactly like that. And you go through that. And so forth, with, so with the, with the other ones as well. In the synagogues, they do that. As we come to Rosh Hashanah, what is Rosh Hashanah? Uh, 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 um, you, might he, you might heard it pronounced Rosh, Rosh, Hasha, Rosh Hashanah. That's not really how you pronounce it. It's Rosh Hashanah. Um, but what does that represent? Well, it's a very interesting day because there are a number of names that are wrapped around that name. It is an interesting day, which is, uh, 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 which is the sighting, the very sighting of, of the new moon. And it, it's a whole different bunch of things that is identified and it actually goes over a, a couple of days, period of time. Um, and it changes every year on the Gregorian calendar. But there are a couple of things that are very, very representative here. Uh, in the Hebrew, it is called um, uh, Yom HaKaseh which is an interesting name because it literally means the hidden day or the day that no one knows. Does that sound a little bit familiar to you? Hmm, what could that be representing? Um, it's the return of Jesus. Not, not, the when, not when his feet touch the, the soil in Jerusalem, but when he meets his church in the air. Or, or in other words, the rapture. Of the church, you say, "Well, you, Chris, Pastor Chris, are you are you pr predicting uh, the rapture?" Uh, no, I'm telling you that this is a day that, when we come to it on the calendar, we need to uh, respect it and and understand it that it represents that day that is to come when we meet the Lord in the air. Will it happen on a Rosh Hashanah? I don't know. But what I do know is that this day is the day that represents that day. It's quite possible that it would. And if it did, it would happen on a Shemitah and, and so forth and so on. We won't go into all that now. But how can you predict it? No, you can't because it's over a couple of days uh, and it changes every year on the calendar. And so you can't be just going ahead and trying to predict. And anybody that does predict and um, writes books, it's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> You know, I like one guy said, Jesus is going to come back on a Tuesday. I'm absolutely sure of it. And if not, maybe Wednesday. You know? <laughs> so, um, but I do believe that the imminent return of Christ, I do believe that what's been fulfilled in pro biblical prophecy has put everything together, brought everything together. And like the early church, you see, see, the early church would greet each other with a statement. 
It was a very interesting statement. You may have heard of it, Maranatha. Now, we, we greet each other with, hi, bless the Lord, we love you, uh, you know, shalom, uh, different things, we, or the hallelujah. We, you know, as one uh, minister said recently, and I thought this was a good way of putting it, he said, the church today has got the hallelujah down very well, but we need to get back to the Maranatha. And so people would greet. Now, Maranatha is actually a play on words. The word itself means he has come and he is coming. It can mean both of those things. So it's like standing in between those two statements. He has come and he is coming. And so the early church would encourage one another, because that's what the scripture tells us, encourage one another with these words. And they would look at each other in the midst of tribulations and trials and difficult situations, and they would say, Maranatha, hang in there, he's coming, he's coming. Now, the scripture says, in the last days, men's hearts will grow cold. And people will actually start to get a little bit sassy about this and saying, well, where's the, where's his prom- the promise of his coming? Even now, nothing's changed. Now you go on as we get closer and closer and closer to the time, more and more people are forgetting the whole thing and saying, no, nah, leave that whole eschatology, leave that end time stuff alone. You know, just, 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 just don't even think about it. No, but, but according to the New Testament church, this was very, very important to the point where this was their greeting and their, and their departing from one another every time. So we need to keep, now Patsy Caminetti says this, and I've, I've, I've loved this from the first time I heard her say it. She says, the balanced gospel and the way we need to live right now is you have one hand on the first coming uh, of Jesus and the, the other hand on the soon coming of Jesus. And you hold on to both of those things, you're going to keep yourself in biblical balance. Hallelujah. You live your life because the way you live your life is because of the first coming and in light of the second coming of Jesus. And don't get confused, though. Don't get biblically confused. That Jesus, this is not when Jesus puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. That is seven years after we meet him in the clouds. I don't have time to go into all the biblical dynamics of that. Again, you can go back and listen to that online. Uh, praise God. So the head of the year. So we've been in, the, in Ain, and, and we're now about to step over into uh, the decade of... Uh, of pay, of the mouth. Um, we don't have those images, do we? We do? Oh, well done, guys. Aren't they good? Um, can you bring up the one that's got the yod, the calf, the hidden bet? Can you bring that one up? Well done. Now, this on the left is the pay. And the pay, as I said, is that now it, it also represents the mouth. If you look at it, you can kind of see a face. Maybe you can't yet. Uh, you're, stop looking at the black part in the middle. Uh, a sewing machine. Okay, Jilly, well done. No, um, there's kind of a face. If you cut, if you start from the bottom, if you start from the bottom, you've got a chin, and then you've got a mouth, and then you've got a nose, and then you've got a little hair flick at the top. That okay. Anyway, it, 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 facing that way. Now Hebrew goes from left to right, guys. Okay, you've got to think. You're going to have to switch your brain around a little bit. But anyway, pay represents the mouth. It also represents the face, uh, the face of God, his face shining upon you and so forth and so on. There's a lot in it that we don't have time to get into today. But what's interesting, well, a number of things that are, that are interesting in this. Um, uh, let me just go to a, a, some things, some studies that I've been doing on, uh, on this and open this up for you. Uh, the meaning of pay uh, means mouth, and by extension, words, expression, vocalization, speech, and breath. In order of the Hebrew al- alphabet, pay follows the letter ayin, suggesting priority of the eyes or understanding or awareness before verbal expression. Negatively reversed this, in this order uh, is blind consumption or mindless chatter. So in other words, you don't want, you, you need to, you don't want to speak before you perceive. You want to perceive and then speak, right? Okay. Um, swift to observe and then to offer an opinion about something. A in it gives insight, but it's the pay mouth that gives insight expression. That it gives it expression, it gives it substance. Um, uh, the letter pay is composed of two letters. Now, here's what I want you to see: a calf and a yud. Uh, the yud is one of the, one a little letter, and it, so the, the reason is this is this particular letter is written with two strokes. First of all, you you do the little yud, and then you or it's an inverted yud, and then the kaf, which is a second part of the letter. Now, if you don't know your Hebrew letters, you're going to have to take my word for it. Um, but that that is that is the truth. Uh, 
A calf and a yud. Now, there's, so there's two letters contained within the one letter. The word calf means container. It's the container. So it's the container of words. Are words being containers? Uh, contain, words contain what? Faith or fear, primarily. Um, the yud is, is interesting because it's, a con, it's, it's, it's the mouth that contains the yud. What does the yud stand for? The divine spark. The divine spark, that is uh, the zoe of God. It's the life of God. It's the spirit of God. It's the spirit of man, which is the spirit of God in man. It's the breath of God that breathed into man by his mouth into Adam. Can you see how all this fits together? In one little, one little letter, you've got, this, you've got the whole of the beginning of how everything started, all wrapped up into one little letter. And you can see, you're going to see something even more amazing in a minute. Uh, it says this, since pay follows ayin, certain Jewish uh, uh, mystics have maintained that through the ayin is the gateway to reality. The mouth is what brings reality into being. This is alluded to within the scriptures, especially when God's creative activity, yud heh vav -Hey's word, is considered. In fact, the, the onkelos, which is a, um, uh, an ancient Aramaic translation uh, of scripture, which is regarded as very accurate, uh, though it dates back to the first century, renders the phrase nefesh chaya, or living soul, in, in, in uh, Genesis 2.7, I believe it is, where God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. It, it renders it as ruach memala, which means a speaking spirit. A speaking spirit. So, so a, something that's, that was different, that had a mouth, that had voice, that had the divine spark as a container of that word and spark, or, or really the life of God or the Zoe of God. Um, God's speech creates reality, and since man is made Bethlehem Elohim in the image of God, the sages reason that it was the power of speech and rationality that distinguished mankind from lower animals that the Lord God created. So God created lots of things on the earth, but there was only one of which he breathed the, his own DNA into. And that was the one that he made in his image and in his likeness to have the capacity to both see and speak like God. Very, very different from an ape or a, a, you know, a fish or a, you know, whatever. You, you know, pick, pick an animal. All right. Now, here's an interesting dynamic. As you can see, there's a hidden bet. Bet is the second letter, uh, whereas pay is the 17th letter of the Aleph Bet. Uh, pay, uh, bet is the second letter, Aleph Bet, Gimel Dalet. That's why it's called the Aleph Bet. Like we've got the alphabet. Bet is the, is the middle. Um, so, so here we've got, uh, by the way, pay is what became uh, pi, which became p in the English language. Just for those of you linguists that like to study these things. Um, pi, the symbol, which goes into all sorts of mathematical interesting dynamics as well. So the hidden bet, or the now bet, why is the why is the hidden bet in, in this important? Now get this, you got you're gonna love this. this. Well, I this just almost I have to throw myself back from my desk when I see stuff like this, because I just got to soak it in for a minute. All right. So so here's the mouth, the word, which is contain which is a container of the divine spark. Within it, as it's written in its proper form, is a hidden bet. Bet is the first letter of the word of God. The first letter of the word Bereshit, which Bereshit means beginnings. So in the beginning was the word. And the word was God. Oh my goodness. All of that's in one tiny little letter, which is the letter representing the, the year that we're about to step over into tonight. Isn't this exciting? Let this sort of stir you up just a little bit. It's amazing when you start to tap in to some of these, these things. This, this capacity to, to open the mouth and God come out. The word. God's word to come out of your mouth. Praise God. Think about this. Think about Peter. Remember Jesus talking to Peter and his disciples? And Jesus said, to, to the disciples, who do men say that I am? In other words, what's the general consensus that's out there? What's the world saying out there about who I am? 
And they came up, man, they reported a bunch of stuff, and it was some weird stuff. Everything from reincarnation to, you know, is it reincarnation? Yeah. So some of them thought it was John the Baptist. Some of them thought, thought he was Elijah. You know? They came up with some, some really interesting statements. But then Jesus asked specifically, okay, but who do you say that I am? Peter, you got to love Peter. I mean, Peter just steps up there. You know, I don't know. He's like, let me through, boys. I don't know what Peter planned to say because whatever Peter thought about saying, he didn't say, which is probably a good thing because when Peter actually says what he thinks to say, he gets himself into trouble half the time. <laughs> Remember up on the mountain of transfiguration? He said, let's make some tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And it says specifically because he didn't know what else to say. <laughs> so he just, he just came up with that, you know. Uh, anyway... Um, other, other times, in fact, in a little while, we're going to see, in a little while, if you read on after this, you're going to see Peter open his mouth and say some pretty dumb stuff, not, not long after this. But in this particular moment, Peter opens his mouth and God comes out. How do we know that? What did he say next? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, how do we know that Peter didn't come up with that? Because Jesus, what Jesus said next was, flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you. You, d you didn't get that out of your brain or what anybody else said. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So Peter opened his mouth and the Father came out. The Father's words came out of his pay. The divine spark was revealed out of his mouth. Hallelujah. So in the beginning, Bereshit, that in the middle, the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Praise God. A speaking spirit, just like God himself has a speaking spirit. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Praise God. Truth, truth. What is truth? Your Word is truth, the Scripture says. Back to the Word. It's all, it all goes in circles. It all comes back around on itself. So, so we see this hidden, hidden bet, this word, um, uh, and so forth. Uh, it, it's very, very interesting as you, as you study it out um, concerning this. Now, I want to go back to my notes now. Um, let's go back into my notes. Praise God. So we look at John, John 1, 1, as we just quote, uh, quoted a few seconds ago. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we see the very beginning or the, the genesis or the bereshit of everything that was made. And as, as Mark pointed out uh, really well last week, and God said, then God said, then God said. But what was attached to the end of those, those paragraphs was God said, and it was. Then God said, and it was. Then God said, and it was. And oftentimes we also see, and it was good. But then we get to man the creation of man from Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and so forth, and says, God, and God said, let us make man in our image and so forth. And then, it's, and then it says it was very good. Very, tov me'od, very, very good. And so man was made that way uh, because of that. Now, um, Genesis 2, 7 as I, as I quoted to you earlier, let me just read that scripture out to you. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, or the ruach, the spirit, breath, it's the same word in Hebrew, of life. And man became a living being or a speaking spirit. He, had, he, was, he was a being, he was one that was created with the same divine spark and DNA of God inside of him. Well, isn't that what we've been studying of recent weeks about, not, about living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit? Because we've been given the DNA of God, because we've been made like Him, because uh, of the same nature as Him. Praise God. So the mouth is the expression of the breath or Spirit. Words are the calf, um, the, 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 the container of creative faith substance. Um, can you just throw up that other image, uh, the Bereshit, and it, was there a second image that you saw there in, the, in that same folder? If not, don't worry about it. Um, Tishri 1. You got it? Okay, can you see this? So Bereshit, uh, on the right, going from right to left, is in the beginning. 
You can see the bet at the beginning there. It, all of the letters, now in the Hebrew, every word that has all the same letters in different order, have, they have to relate to each other. Because numerically, they add up to the same. Every letter in Hebrew has a number, and every word, every word is a com combination of numbers, and every word that has the same number have to relate to one another. It's a, it's, we don't have time to go, I, I, I can't go this, down this rabbit hole because I will be there for hours, because I love this stuff. It just gets me so excited. But here's the thing. It, you can rearrange the, every word that you can... You know, we've got this in English. You can rearrange a word and make it another word. But in English, they don't, they don't relate. But in Hebrew, they always do. They have to. So one of the interesting... Um, well, there's a word. There's a technical word for it. Homophone. Is that right? No. That's I don't, when it sounds the same. That's when it sounds the same. Anyway, but, but this, this, is, this one, in the beginning, one of the words that it, it, will, or it relates to is... Um, uh, Aleph Tishri, which means on the first of Tishri. So in the beginning is the first of Tishri in the Hebrew calendar. Well, when is the first of Tishri? It starts tonight. That's, that's what Rosh Hashanah sees in. Can you see how all these things work together? So there's no coincidences in all this. This is divinely connected and all works together. Hallelujah. And so now we see that the mouth is the expression or, 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 got, or got within it the, con, the context. So when we look in the word, when we look to, again at Genesis chapter 1, we say, in the beginning God said, and it was. Now then he got Adam uh, to, to do something. What was Adam given the job to do? Speak, creatively. God is training Adam right from the very beginning. Uh, God puts all the physical bodies together of the animals, but they're not yet fully formed. The Hebrew gives us a bit more of a clue on this than, than the English. When uh, God, it says God brought all the animals before Adam to see if there would be a helper comparable for him. Remember that? That word brought means it literally is the word for carried in Hebrew. So he didn't whistle and they all just trotted past. God actually physically brought them because they weren't finished yet. Whose job was it to finish them? Adam's job. Adam was supposed to speak a word that would produce the life. They were living, breathing, but they were not yet completely finished. There was an identification that needed to be given to them within the Hebrew that would make an elephant an elephant, or a, a giraffe a giraffe, or a lion a lion, or a bear a bear, or whatever. And so, and so Adam was given the privilege of, of, of being taught how to speak creatively in the same way God does. Isn't that amazing? And so the Bible says whatever Adam called them, that's what its name was, or that's what its essence, or that's what it became from that moment on. So Adam did, you know, and Adam didn't just kind of pull gobbledygook out of the air, you understand. He didn't just say, duck boo platypus, <laughs> you know, or, or, ducky, or, you know, giraffe, or whatever. <laughs> He didn't just kind of pull names out of just thin air and just, yeah, shah, blah, 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 blah. You know, we'll just call it that. No, he was pulling on the Hebrew letters which had equations, numerical, musical. He actually might have sung these words because every Hebrew letter is also a musical note. And out of the 22 Hebrew letters, there's 22 strings on David's harp, and you can actually play the Psalms from the Hebrew letters musically, or it's orchestrated that way. It's phenomenal. Um, and so, the, so there's both there's about 40 levels to every letter. You can it's music, it's it's letters, it's numbers, it's colors, it's it's got all sorts of equations in all of this. And so when Adam formulated a word, it's almost, you can almost, you can almost say, I don't know, if, if, if you could just kind of almost hear this divine echo, come out with a word, kind of the mind of God and all that's contained, all of the physics and the, the, the dynamics and all the, all the wisdom that would be contained in this one word. Adam didn't have the, you know, he didn't make this up himself, he was pulling on the mind of God and that mind of God, he had the capacity to function with that and this whole echo of what, what, was, what, was, what was to be just elephant in Hebrew, you know, not English. 
but it came out and those words created the DNA and the, and the very essence and the, 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 uh, the algebra and everything else, or the, the, the chemical equations and the numerical substance and all that science can now pick apart and discover about anything, that was all put in there with a, with a word. Phenomenal. The creative capacity that God has, but then think about the creative capacity that he put in the mouth of a person. Why? Because it's, it's what he designed him for. It's his child. It's his son. He, he, Adam was the first son of God. The New Testament confirms that for us. Hallelujah. Jesus became the, the last Adam to bring us back to that original intent. Speaking spirits. Conform to the image of Christ. Praise God. So we see this uh, take place. Now, I want you to quickly to go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. I want to show you some things, things that have come, come up in my study this week. Deuteronomy 30. Concerning faith and concerning the words of our mouths and what's in our hearts. Because... There is something that the Lord's been showing me this week, and it's really important to get, to get the basis of this. Deuteronomy 30, 11, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you. Now, don't think of this as so mysterious and so far off and just un... No, no, tap it, listen in the Spirit. This won't be too difficult for you. This, this, if, you listen, if you try and work it all out with your head, yeah, it's gonna, you're going to give yourself a bit of a, a headache on this. But if you, if you listen with your Spirit right now, this is not going to be too mysterious. Listen. For this command which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, for, nor is it far off, nor is it in heaven, that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say where, wh wh who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. Where is it? It's already somewhere. It's already in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. God can't expect you to do something that's afar off. It's got to be something that's a part of you for you to fulfill that. It's already in your heart and in your mouth. Praise God. This, this is the prophetic connection. See, I've set before you uh, today life and good, dead and evil, that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments, His statutes, His judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, of course, you know, the context, God's speaking to Israel here. I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over to the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death. Now, in what context? What's said? Look at the next words. Blessing and cursing. Those are words. So the context of death and life or life and death is in the context of words. And all of heaven and earth is witness to this. Because heaven and earth were created by this, by words. So they're witness to what God is saying now, I call all of heaven and earth as witness to this reality, to this spiritual truth that I set before you today. Death, uh, life and death, blessing and cursing. All of life and death is wrapped up in either blessing or cursing. It's wrapped up in words. Therefore, choose life. Another way you could say that is choose blessing. What comes out of your mouth if you choose to bless instead of curse, you choose life instead of death. And not just concerning you, but concerning the people you're speaking to. That you may, that both you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Now, you say, well, okay, but I get that. I hear that. I understand the spiritual principle of that. But isn't that Old Testament? Sure it is. Does it have any relevance to us in the New Testament? Sure it does. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. 
Praise God. Are you, in there? Are you hanging in there with me? Yeah. All right. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. Not just natural law, but spiritual law. The man who does these things shall live by them. But, now listen, in the natural law, the right, righteousness was, a, was accounted to, for, for what was believed and what was done. But spiritual law is by what's believed and what's said. Look, look at it if you don't believe me. Verse 6. But the righteousness of faith speaks. Faith that is in right standing with God and the right standing of God that produces the substance of faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the faith that comes by hearing the Word, the faith that comes by being the presence of God to hear the Word of, of God, faith, the righteousness of faith speaks. It doesn't keep silent. It actually formulates in the words in this way. Way, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth. It's the same scripture. It's near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith. Have you ever wondered why people call this kind of belief structure, the word of faith, it's, from, it's rooted in this particular verse. It's the word of faith is descriptive of what is believed in the heart and released with the mouth. The image and the substance, praise God. That is the word of faith which we preach which, or which we declare. You, you, it's not the word of faith if it's only believed. It is the word of faith if it's believed in the heart and then spoken with the mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach, which we declare, which we say. That if you confess with your mouth, now someone says, well, I'm not sure about this word of faith stuff. Then you're not born again. How can I make that statement? Read on with me. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you go on and read in Romans chapter uh, uh, 10 here, it says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you don't believe in heart, heart belief, mouth confession, how can you be saved? Because that's how you got saved. Some people need to go back to the very beginning of how they got saved to figure out how to live now. This is the substance. This is the image. This is the eye end of what you see Belief, heart belief, image, substance, and then mouth confession, word substance that produces, and God said, and it was. Now what about, and you said, and it was? So you see, we've got, many Christians have got to the place where they believe what God said. What did God say? Let's get back to that. That's what Mark was encouraging us to do last week. Then we have a responsibility once we've heard what God says. You, the question next is, what are you going to say? Yeah. What's, what is your mouth, your pay, going to do with that next? Now, if you keep silent on what God says to say, you've got a problem. Because you're not going to release the creative substance that God has put in your heart and in your mouth to actually produce what needs to be produced next around you. So if you're silent concerning what God did say, you're going to, you've got a problem. On the other side, if you say what God didn't say, you've also got a problem. Because you're going to still be speaking creatively, but you're going to create in your life, in your world, in your surroundings, things that you don't necessarily want. You can, you can go ahead and try and create your future if you want to. Ask Abraham. He had a go at that. Wasn't working out quite. He was a bit old. His wife said, hey, why don't you take my maid? Abraham's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we get an Ishmael. And it takes an entire, Ishmael has to grow up into the age 13 to be actually become into adulthood before God, he, before Abraham even hears from him again. There's a, you, you, when you don't read that in the scripture, well, you do read it in the scripture, you don't get it necessarily because you're reading, you know, across three chapters in five minutes. But, but actually there was 13 years with absolute silence because 
Abram decided to have a go himself. And it shut the word of God down for 13 years. And it wasn't until Ishmael was 13 that God then again spoke to Abraham. And he said, now, have you finished? Can, can I get back on track now? Interesting, isn't it? So you don't want to make Ishmael's with your word seed. Your words are seeds. You don't want to be speaking. Now, now, this is why the importance of this, we're about to step over into a decade of this manifestation which is going to bring about some immediate results. You know, if Jesus walked into the room today and looked into every single one of your eyes and said, whatever you say next, you immediately get. Whatever you say next is going to instantly happen. I, I, I don't know about you, but I would be judging everything before it came out of my mouth next. I would want to make sure that I wasn't about to say something really goofy that produced real goofiness in my life. You know, and I don't, certainly don't want, to, I don't want to curse anyone. You know, you're watching a, watching a, 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 a sports thing on television. Ref, you're blind! Oh, he's... Oops, sorry. <laughs> Stupid car won't start for me. Every day, it never stops. These feet, my feet are killing me. <laughs> you think, oh, you're just being pedantic. Listen, folks, why? But death and life are in the power of the yeah. tongue, and those that love it will eat its fruit. Now, we've gotten away with it for a while now. How have we gotten away with it? Now, long term, you won't get away with anything unless you get an opportunity to change that, uproot that, and replant good words. So what God's had to do is slow time down in terms of the manifestation of your words because God says he will not be mocked whatsoever a man sows that he will also reap. So if you sow words then they are act, actually, they immediately go into the growth process to produce a harvest. Now, God, in his wisdom and in his love for you, has slowed down the process of that to some degree so that you can get corrected, that you can realize, whoops, that's not what I want. I repent, dig up the seed. I repent. <laughs> Quick, Lord, I repent. In the name of Jesus, I uproot that word. I cut that word off in the name of Jesus. And Father, I, I now speak the blessing. Now, the only reason that is in his, by his grace is slowing that down. So we say, well, how come we're not getting instant results to our prayers? Well, have you listened to your words lately? Maybe it's the grace of God that has slowed the process down in your life. But folks, I'm telling you, we're about to step over into a season of time where God can't keep the brakes on anymore. He needs the church to act, be activated with their mouth to speak prophetically and see things come to pass. There's people, there's people who, who need your words. There are, there are lame people that need to, to, need to have released over their lives. Rise up and walk. Well, you can't be speaking that and expecting results and then, you know, the next minute you over here and you're cursing this and you're cursing that. James talks about this. Out of the same vessel can't come two different, completely different things. We'll get back to that in a second. So we're coming into this time where the word is near you. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. This is the word of faith. This is the substance. This is the creative speech. This is the divine spark. This is the speaking spirit that you are. Hallelujah. In fact, in terms of salvations, if people try to get people saved any other way, if, there's, if they're not understanding, believing in their heart and confessing with their mouth, but believing in their heart what? Specifically, you've got to believe in your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead. If someone doesn't believe in their heart that Jesus is raised from the dead, you can't just get them to confess Jesus is Lord and get them saved. That's, they, they haven't activated the spiritual law. So actually in our evangelism, we need to, we need to make sure that they understand uh, that, 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 that sin. We need to understand the life of God. We need to under, them, them to understand the blood of Jesus. We need to understand the process, the resurrection, new life. Uh, we've got, if they, we don't explain all of that to them, and 
One day we'll get David up to maybe do the, the wordless book because it brings all of those dynamics. It's a simple little tool that brings all those dynamics into a very simple evangelistic tool that leads a person to understand all of these things, to a pers- bring a person to a point of decision, whereas, yes, I believe Jesus lived, died, and rose again, and I want to make him my Lord. And that belief and confession is what activates a spiritual explosion that brings a person out of darkness into light. But it, it's the same process of their salvation as that wor- it works everything by faith. <coughs> Hallelujah. You can't confess before you believe. <laughs> I mean, you can, put, you can say it and 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 say it so that you're hearing it and you can meditate on a word that you haven't quite got to grips with yet and put it in your mouth and put it in your mouth and put it in your mouth, but you haven't released any faith yet. You can say it and say it and say it and say it until you believe it, and then once you've believed it and it gets big enough in here, then what, well, see, here's the thing, here's the difference. You can say it and say it and say it and say it and say it because you're, you're working on it and you're meditating on it, but then it gets in your heart and it gets really big in your heart, and then one day you go to say it and it comes out with gusto. It's like you go to say it like you have done before, and all of a sudden it's almost like the whole building shakes. Boom! It's like, whoa! Because it came out of faith, it came out of a... Belief, yes, out of the spirit. It was actually a, it was actually a virtue that came out of you. That's what that woman. That's what Jesus felt when that woman reached out to touch the hem of his robe. Why? Help, robe. Why? Not just because she believed she could get healed, because she said, "If I only touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole." And she reached out and touched it, and Jesus felt power go out. <laughs> He's like, "What was? The, who touched me?" Disciples are like, what are you talking about, Jesus? There's people everywhere touching you. He says, no, that touch was different. That was a faith touch. That pulled power out of me. Why? Because she said. She believed it, and she said it. She got it. And he looked at her, and she said, woman, your faith has made you whole. He actually almost said, I didn't really have anything to do with that. It was on you. You got it. You pulled it out of me. Isn't that good? Man, that's good stuff. So, so here's the thing. Here's what the Lord's been instructing me in. I believe that in this next week, as we step over, you, you better get a handle on this. Because as the Lord said to me about this, he says it's not only going to be important what you say, it's also going to be important what you don't say. And there were moments in Jesus' ministry, it says, he opened not his mouth. There were moments in Jesus' ministry it was important for him not to say anything. And there was other times where it was important for him to say something. Now, if you're a verbal processor, <laughs> you're going to have to get a handle on this. Because you can't just be spitting it all out and then trying to retract it all back later on. You know, make, you, you're going to need to learn how to talk this out with God before you release it into the atmosphere. You know? I mean, still go and talk to God about stuff. Cover, just cover that by the blood. And, you know, God, I need to talk to you about something right now. But don't go spouting it out to everybody else before you've processed it with the Lord. And saying a bunch of stuff that you've re- have released over your life or over other people's life. I'm telling you, God is... Now, let me quickly look at a couple of uh, scriptures with me on this. Um, Do you remember Isaiah? Isaiah? In chapter 6, Isaiah is very focused on his mouth being impure. He's, he's just experienced the presence of God. He's just seen the glory of God. And he's like, woe is me. <laughs> <laughs> woe is me. I, I'm undone. He said, I'm just completely just... He says, because I'm a man of unclean lips. Isaiah knew that his impurity was due to his mouth, not just his actions. So the actions that you do are going to, are going to be a representation of what's been in your heart and what you've said. It's going to, it's going to come to pass. You're going to do those things. So, so Isaiah knew that and he said, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He wasn't making an excuse. He was saying that's Everybody, we're all like this. The, the whole, I mean, 
I'm surrounded by unclean words. I speak unclean words. Woe is me. I'm undone. He, I mean, he probably thought he was about to drop dead in the presence of God. And, he, and actually probably close to it if the grace of God had not stepped in just now for, for Isaiah's calling and destiny. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs, with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. Ow! <laughs> and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Now, now think about this. One, one minute, here's Isaiah. Just a mess on the floor. I'm undone. My mouth, uh, my mouth, I'm, I'm, I'm as good as dead. And I'm surrounded by people who are in the same state. All he, all he could think about was how unclean his, he was because of his words. Neck minute. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally two seconds later, after the cleansing power of the coals of the, thr of the throne of God touched his mouth, next minute, he's not the same man anymore. How do we know that? Look at look what happens next. Verse 8. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Isaiah's like, yeah. <laughs> Here I am! Send me! Wait a minute. Two seconds ago, you're like, Woe is me. Now you're like, Here is me! Send me! What happened? His words got cleansed. Qualified him. And Isaiah didn't qualify himself. The cleansing power of God, the grace of God, touched his mouth, the fire of God, positioned him, and all of a sudden he's got a boldness. Why? Because he's in right standing with God. Well, the righteousness of faith speaks. You say, well, that was pretty bold of him. Well, really? He's righteous in the presence of God right there. He can, say, he can say what's in his heart and in his mouth now. Praise God. Listen to, look at, listen to this in Jeremiah 1.9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Sounds like Jeremiah had a very similar experience to Isaiah. The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, we better, we better get serious about getting this thing you can't, now, now, we're going to get to this in just a second. We'll close in a minute, but I, I've just got to give you these scriptures. Um, someone might say, well, the Bible says no man can tame the tongue. So I've got Buckley's of being able to do this. I, I've tried, I've failed, I've tried to control my mouth. It didn't work. You know, how many of you have been in a situation where you're having a conversation with somebody and you've just got a zinger? You just know what you just know you could say this and it would just flatten the person. And you're thinking in your heart, because you're a Christian, right? <laughs> you're thinking in your heart, I'm not gonna say it. I'm not I'm not I'm not I said it. <laughs> Whoop, it came out. Whoa, bang, slap, you slapped him down. And now now you've got to repent. Now I'm so sorry. Well, it doesn't really mean anything to now. Because... But how many times have we thought, I'm not gonna say it, I'm not gonna say it. Whoops, I said it again. Why? Because, because you're trying to control the tongue by natural means. You can't do that. You're going to say what's in your Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, now, the, now ultimately, you've got to change what's in your heart. Now, again, you can't even do that. But how does that happen? The Word of God. So Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of what? The heart. So we've got to get the word in the heart more than anything else. The word of God, you can't clean your mouth, you can't clean your speech, you can't clean your heart, but the word of God can. The, Jesus said to the disciples, you are clean because of the word. Or in other words, if you look at it in the Greek, literally it's like a, 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 a plant where all of the extra uh, grow, all the extra growth that was su sucking all of the sap and the energy of the plant that wouldn't produce. So what, what, what do you have to do to a, to a plant if you want it to produce good fruit or good flowers? You have to prune off all of the suckers, all of the extra things. And that's what, the, that's what Jesus was actually saying when it says you are clean or pruned because of the word. The word will actually chop off and separate you from all of that extra stuff that's not going to produce any fruit. 
Isn't that good news? So, so James says, No man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth produce ble- produ- proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, now listen, these things ought not to be so. So he's saying, don't, don't, that's not right. So if it's not right, there must be a right. Well, we know there is a right because the Bible's full of all these words containing the spirit man that can. The natural mind can't. His, words, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Yeah, you can't do this with your natural thinking. If you go to try and approach your business, your parenting, your marriage, your friendships, you try and approach any of that from natural thought patterns, you're going to get stuck, you're going to trip up, you're going to at some point. But if you'll allow the Spirit of God to give you the wisdom, if you'll go to the Word of God and get wisdom, don't get your wisdom from Oprah. (laughs) That's not going to help you. I'm serious. Don't get your wisdom from Dr. Phil or or Judge Judy or someone that, you know, I don't know. Get your word, I mean, don't, you know, get, this is where the wisdom is. You've got to put this in your heart and in your mouth and release it. And so, and so again, in, 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 uh, in Psalm 81.10, as Pastor C brought out in pre-service prayer, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Now, we often use that verse in terms of the context of being the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but breath goes in and breath goes out. Spirit in, spirit out. Be, be, being filled, but there's also a be ye outflowing. <laughs> out of your belly shall flow. Amen. So when you open wide your mouth, you can <gasps> breathe in the word and you can <gasps> breathe out the word. You can <gasps> breathe in the spirit and you can <gasps> breathe out the spirit. You <gasps> yud hey, <gasps> vav hey. Uh, we don't have time to go into that, but, <laughs> but there is, there is a, that you open mouth, open your wide, open mouth, Open wide your mouth and God will fill it. God's, God wants to speak through you. God needs to speak through you. This world needs God to speak through you. Your kids need God to speak through you. You should be blessing them, not cursing them. It's one of the wonderful things about the Shabbat meal in every Jewish home on every Friday night. There is one time in the week, every single week, where the father of the household will lay, go around and lay hands on all of the members of the family, his wife, his kids, and he will bless them, speak blessings over them every single week. That's, one, that's a beautiful thing. Blessing, not cursing, you see. So as we come into tonight, as we step into tonight, I would recommend you take some time with the Lord this afternoon. <laughs> Let the coals... Do what the coals do from, from, the, from the throne of God. Let, let, let what Jesus' blood has already obtained and what he's already purchased. You're not going to do anything yourself. You're just simply receiving the cleansing that Jesus has already paid for you. Let, I, mean, I mean, just lay it out there and say, God, you know what? Just be honest with him. Say, I've said a bunch of stupid stuff up to this point. There's been a th- bunch of stuff that's come out of my mouth, things that have discredited me, things that have disqualified me, things that have upset people, things that have hurt. Th- I've created certain things in my life because of my words. It stops now. I'm stepping over into this decade where I want, I want to see instant results. I want to speak over the business I'm involved in. I want to speak over my marriage. I want to speak over my children. I want to speak over this day. I want to speak over my church. I want to bless my pastor. I'm going to speak blessing over him. I'm going to speak... I mean, I'll just slip myself in there, you know. I'm quite happy for you to pray for me and bless me. You know what I'm saying? Speak words over me. Praise the Lord. And so I would, su- I would suggest before sundown, maybe even at, as the sun's going down tonight, just maybe take communion. Maybe just, just set, sanctify that moment with the Lord. Get your family together. Get the communion out. And, and say, Lord, here we are as we step over on your timetable. From the, from the decade of seeing and knowing into now speaking those images, speaking prophetically, releasing the substance. Hallelujah. Did you get some things out of that today? Was it insightful, helpful, assisting you? That's what I was hoping. And I, I want us to also get the, the, maybe the severity of this moment as we step over tonight as well. I mean, if you hear trumpet blast, 
And then, then it's easy. You're going to be in the air with Jesus. I mean, that's not, a, that's not going to be a problem. You're going to have an issue with the mouth. But if we don't hear that trumpet blast tonight, and we don't meet the Lord in the clouds as we step over into, into that Rosh Hashanah, then, then we've got some assignments to do. And our assignments and to do the work of God, to do the will of God, is going to be with, with the Word of God. Amen? That divine spark released in those words. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Would you stand up with me? Praise God. And we're going to sing. We've got a song to sing as we go out. We want to go out praising. Hallelujah. And so uh, I just want to bless you. Um, something that uh, uh, Paul Brady actually said the other day, which was highlighted to him. Um, and it's part of actually a prophetic conference he was just at just recently. It, it was, I found this interesting. But they said there's, a, there's much to be made of because pay is part of the mouth and the face, um, there was a, um, a, a release of, of, of the scripture concerning the Lord bless you and, and keep you. The Lord uh, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. That blessing, that priestly blessing, um, in the Hebrew it's Yevarechecha Adonai Vishmerecha Yeel Adonai Panavilecha. Now, did you hear that? Panav, pe, Panav, the face. And give you peace and shalom. See, that's actually something that that is we need to actually get a more of an understanding about because this is now a season where this peace comes from the face, from the word, from the mouth of God. Hallelujah. So, Father, I I speak that blessing over over everybody right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I I thank you. I thank you for what you've done and you've put and you've given in our lives. Father, I thank you for this message we've heard even even today. Father, I thank you um, for for every every dynamic that we've heard in, in the spirit today. Lord, let that revelation flow in the name of Jesus. Let let the blessing of those words come up big on the inside of us today in the mighty name of Jesus of Jesus. Hallelujah. And, uh, and so I want to say that blessing over you in Hebrew and in English. And then as, as soon as I finish that, we can start that praise if that's all right. And so just receive this in the name of Jesus. Yeverechecha Adonai veishmerecha Yeer Adonai penavilecha veyonecha Yesar Adonai penavilecha veyesayim lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.